Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Perfectly Imperfect Duo with myself, Sari, and the lovely Lily. Um, today, we are based on myself asking on Instagram recently what you'd like us to talk about. One thing that came up uh, numerous times was to talk about fears and phobias, um, of which there can be many. There's, you know, there's some quite common ones, I suppose. Um, but I, there's uh, there's no end to phobias that people. It never ceases to amaze me when somebody tells me about a new phobia that you think would never exist. It even has its own name, its own um, definition, and it's you know it's never ending, isn't it? Yeah, and it, and I think that I'm not dismissing how scary it can be for somebody if they are thinking about spiders or throwing up, but they're all the same. You know, having a fear of flying or public speaking like the underneath stuff mm -hmm. is is uh is where the healing is to me rather than but it's throwing up or it's spiders or it's flying you know the the yeah. specifics mm -hmm. um are interchangeable to yeah. me yeah same and I think um so I there's always a few examples I always share with phobias particularly with with clients who want to talk to me about phobias that that really for me just highlight exactly that Lily that it amounts to the same thing and I know you'll have heard me talk about this before and I'm always talking about for me any fear always comes back to the same things the uncertainty the unknown and the unpredictability and then we bring the thoughts around that to life so I was doing a training event in a school the other day and there was a little mouse running through the hall while I was presenting. It was the tiniest little mouse, the cutest little thing you've ever seen. Now, if it had been a rat, I would have felt different. But it was this tiny little mouse. It was actually borderline pretty cute. And so many people were freaking out. And I asked, it was funny because it was um, one of the teachers there is a really good friend of mine. And so I picked on her and because she was literally jumping on her chair pretty much. And I was saying, what is it? what is it that is so scary about that mouse? She said, I've got a terrible phobia of mice. I said, what is it? Because for me, I just can't see it. It's like, it's tiny, it's cute. Um, it certainly isn't scary. And she said, the way she started to describe, she went, oh, it's just, it's fast, it's furry, it's long tail. And she she like did this, show me the length of the tail with her hands, which was like five times, if not more bigger than the actual whole mouse. So it was like, you can see the exaggeration in her her sense is bringing to life this version of this mouse, which looked very different in her head than the reality, even though it was in front of her and she could see how tiny it was. Even the gestures of her hands were showing something very different. So her version of it, of that mouse, even that mouse right in front of her, her version of that was created through her thinking, which gave her a very different reality of that mouse. Um, I always, at one point in my membership, I had two people. One had a fear of, small spaces, agoraphobia, and another person had a fear of open spaces. They didn't like walking across open fields or open spaces because they felt like there was nothing to hold on to, like this feeling of not feeling grounded. And that was always an interesting conversation because it's like, so you both have phobias around the exact opposite. So how does that work? How can we, you know, it's either scary or it's not. It's either, you know, it we look at the thing that we believe is we're fearful of and make up our mind and loads of decisions and stories around creating this version of it that is scary when in actual fact the person sat next to us could have the exact opposite experience of the same thing yeah I love that because when you realize that you're like oh it's not small spaces it's you know because if it was everybody would be afraid of small spaces. And I think when you can see that without judgment and you don't think something's wrong with me because nobody else is afraid of small spaces. You know, we don't want to use it against ourselves, but we, when you can see it, of, oh, isn't that interesting? I wonder what's going on, you know, that, and I'm not, there's nothing right or wrong with being afraid of small spaces or I'll share for me. I don't, I used to not like turbulence and take off on a plane, especially. And I think it, it became, I uh, disliked it again after the lockdown when, cause I'd taken a break from flying, you know, as a lot of us did, you know, for a year or so. And I got back into it and it kind of felt strong, stronger of, Oh, this turbulence. And, um, but what I did, I didn't, 
it didn't have too much energy on it. It was actually, I wouldn't have any thinking about it. And then the turbulence would happen. And I would think, I forgot, I hate this. But when you were saying sitting next to each other, my son could care less. Like takeoffs happening. And I'm like, or I used to think, my brain would be spinning. It just like every creek that would be happening on the plane seemed dangerous. Like, and like the what's turbulence- that noise? What's that noise? Why is it doing that? <laughs> yeah. And my brain just was like, we could be, be crashing, but it was, I, I was able to have like a, I guess a curious approach to it or whatever, like, cause it would, turbulence would happen. And I'd see my eight-year-old who's eight now. So I guess when it would happen, he would be seven or something, not bothered at all. And sometimes I'd want to hold his hand and he just like, brush me off. Mm -hmm. And I thought, Oh, isn't that interesting that he's not worried. And it kind of just took away, um, the energy around it, but I didn't force it because I do think for the first year after I was flying, I really would get startled with turbulence, but I didn't think about it before or after it was just during. And I'd think, Oh, I hate this. And I was totally at peace. Like, because I still flew and it was, I was fine with it. But I think the reason I started that when we can see that it's not fixed, you know, because if it was, everyone would have it, it leaves room for it to change and also, or to stay the same. And then it's no big deal. I hate tight spaces. So then when we're in a tight space, all right, I'm more anxious and it can just be yeah. limited to that experience, you know, cause I'm not saying, oh, we have to just banish all phobias. Um, you know, there's, you don't if, if it doesn't take up too much thinking around yeah. it. I always like to change. So for me, I, I, I'm a bit controversial, really, but I, I do sometimes say to people, there's no such thing as a phobia. They don't, they don't exist. Uh, and for me, we don't have phobias. We have lots of thinking about certain things. So for me, if I was, I mean, I'm just being, you know, just being uh, partly do it just to sort of challenge that idea, really. But for me, it's like, well, what if it's not a phobia and we don't label it a phobia, but actually you just got a lot of thinking around that. And even like with the flying, like fear of flying is probably one of the most common phobias out there. Like it is such a common phobia. And yet the details of that phobia, if we were to write it out, um, if we were to draw what that looks like for each person, whatever, it would be so varied. So, you know, you said about takeoff and landing, People will often say they don't like takeoff, they don't like landing. I loved, even in my my height of fear of flying, I loved landing. And it was almost like, no matter how bumpy, that plane could have literally been dropping thousands of feet in one go, and I would not care, because in my view and my thinking, even if a landing was bumpy, I didn't care, because every second I was closer to that ground. And that, for me, was reassuring. And, you know, people say they like to sit in the aisle seat because then they know they can get out if they need to. I wouldn't get on a pl- plane at one point unless I was in the window seat because I would need to see the clouds. And if I could see the clouds and I could rationalize the turbulence, you know, so we've all got our reasons and justifications and how we manage it. But it's so different from one person to the next, which, again, just shows we... Um, you know, it's it's just our version of it. I always, I love this example as well. It just really, to this day, just makes me laugh because, and I probably probably heard me say this as well. I always apologise, Lily, because I know you've heard me say the same thing so many times. But when um, I went to get my bloods taken a few years ago, I went in to, the two, it was just this lady at the hospital that that was her job. I know they've got a name and I can't remember what it is, but the, her job was to literally take blood from people all day long. And I went into her and I doesn't bother me having blood taken. It's never been a thing. And so I go in and she's like, are you, are you okay? Are you okay about this? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm good. I'm fine. She's like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm good. And then a minute later, she's like, are you sure now? Are you sure you're okay with this? And she's getting the needle and she's like, are you sure you're all right? And I'm starting to question. I'm thinking, why does she keep asking me? So I actually said to her, I said, I am all right. And I've had blood taken loads of times and it doesn't bother me, but I'm now starting to question why you're asking me so much. Like, is this different? Should I be worried? Well, she's like, no, no, it's just that I have a terrible fear of having bloods taken. I was like, how is that your job every day if it's a phobia? What person applies for a job to do their very thing that they fear every single day, all day? And I was almost like laughing. I was always a bit shocked. I was like, she's got to be joking. And then she said, no, 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 I'm fine taking blood from other people. 
I just can't let other people take it from me. And that again is another example that you've either got a phobia of needles or you haven't. It doesn't work in that way. It's like, well, I have a phobia in this circumstance of needles and not in this one. And again, that just shows that we're creating that phobia in our mind. We are creating the rules, the restrictions, the structure around that phobia. And so that's why it's made up. <laughs> we make it up and we have our version of it. And I just always with that. And, and I ended up actually sharing a little bit about the three principles with her while she was taking my blood. Cause I was just like, listen, this just shows it's all from the inside out. And I'm just chatting away. Cause I just thought, surely this is like, how can she say she has a phobia of needles when that is her job? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know I, you were saying it was her job. It made me, I love that story. I, you know, when I, when I found you, I was really struggling with driving anxiety and panic attacks. And I used to remember that I thought it was so interesting because at one point I had joined CrossFit and I wanted to go every day, but it was expensive. And I was a school psychologist and I didn't, I just was like, I need a supplemental job. And this was before Uber and Lyft. So I went on and I drove a woman. I, I volunteered for this job. I picked this job. She had night blindness. And so I would drive her to work and then like, or I'd, I'd pick her up. And I thought I picked it for my job driving. I had zero driving. I used to love to drive. And so I would, I kind of, when I would think that I would think, isn't that so interesting? You know, it wasn't that, oh, I always had driving anxiety. And I know some people might say, but I, I have always, and that's, that's a different conversation, but I love when maybe we can talk about when you said you shared it with her, where it's inside out, mm -hmm. people yeah. might have listened to a lot of our, our episodes. So they might know what you mean when you're, when you're talking about that, but when people can see that it's not the needle, it's not the spider, it's not the mouse, mm -hmm. it's, they are thinking about it. And that kind of gets larger than life. When you were talking about your friend and this exaggerated tale and, you know, where it's our imagination, which is such a gift. Like we want, you know, where, where somebody might, there is somebody's imagination, allow them to write that book when you give a mouse a cookie, you know, and it's like, and then there's all these spinoffs of it because they have this beautiful gift of thought when you give a mouse a cookie. And then when you give a mouse a pancake and when you give a moose a muffin, you know, and, <laughs> and it was such a gift, but for some people, they innocently can think, oh my gosh, this mouse, it's little, it's so scary. And their imagination can terrify them. And it's not good to think of books about mice and bad to have a, what you feel like is a phobia about mice. It's just seeing, oh, wow, this is how we're using thoughts. And it gets brought to life where if somebody's writing a book and they think this might be a bestseller, they might feel really great because that's their thoughts. And they think, oh, wow. Um, they get excited. But if somebody thinks about a, a mouse running around the classroom or running around the house, what if it gets into my classroom? What if it gets into the bag? And then they, they are feeling all of that thinking and it can really feel like danger is in the hallways, danger, danger. But that's just their thinking. Whereas you said, you're right there. You're not feeling danger. You're feeling at ease. Yeah. And it's the, it's I suppose it just comes back to the, that simplicity for me of we are we are always, we are always experiencing the feeling of our thoughts. We're in the feeling of our thinking. And when I spoke to that lady briefly, literally only for a few minutes, so, you know, it was probably a very um, sort of rough and direct conversation, if you like, but, you know, part of what I was saying to her is that we, we are, we are experiencing our reality every second, every moment through our thinking. And just highlighting to her, like, can you see how the only difference between me having a needle and you having a needle is your thoughts? It's a needle. It's both of our arms. It's the exact same experience. And yet you find one really uncomfortable and the other not. Um, and, you know, you um, when we were just kind of. Yeah, I think that was pretty much it. It's just literally sort of saying to her, you're in, you know, you're in the the feeling of your thinking and therefore. Oh, and that was it. It came to. um like I was saying about uncertainty, unpredictability. And so saying, what is the difference for you versus somebody else? And it ultimately comes down to, well, someone else is doing to her. She doesn't feel like she's in any control. She's got control. 
you know, we haven't got control anyway, but it, she feels more in control when she's doing that to somebody else because she chooses when to start. She chooses when to stop. She chooses which direction to, but she chooses. And so again, it's often that, you know, my mom has a phobia of frogs. And when I've asked her what that is and she, her response was almost like, oh, because they just might jump in your face or they might. And it, it, again, that's uncertainty, unpredictability and unknown. What if this happens? What if that happens? And I would invite anybody who has a fear or a phobia to just reflect and think, does it go back to unknown uncertainty and unpredictability? Because my guess is that it absolutely does. Yeah. And our brain doesn't like uncertainty, unpredictability, and unknown. And the great thing is there, we have a greater intelligence behind our brain that is so fine with unpredictability, uncertainty, and unknown. So there's a part of you that's like, I'm fine if this frog jumps in my face. Like yeah, what you're going to you know, do, you're going to instinct, you're going to, your wisdom, you're going to instinctively just react and respond in that moment. You maybe just move back or you might push it away with your hand or you, you know, it, it, you'll go into manage and deal with it. You don't have to practice prepare and imagine what that will be like yeah you know it's interesting I have not really liked sports and stuff you know and especially like I don't want to be I don't like the sports because what if a baseball or just a ball like hits me I don't really want to be hurt um and this isn't a phobia but my son and my daughter is is different but like my son and my daughter love sports love it love it love it and my son you know, when people are, he doesn't care if he gets hit, you know, and, he, and he'll instinctively move, but he doesn't have a whole load of thinking about a ball. Like he's not like flinching, you know, he's just keeping his eyes open. He's just present. He's in it. And, uh, and I, you know, have a lot of thinking and I, um, but so that's just what came to me when you were sharing that, which is like, also it's not good or bad. That's just my experience. And I have a lot of thinking around sports and balls and I don't want to get hit in the face he doesn't, one, he doesn't think that he's also moves or he's like, who cares? Like he just doesn't care. Um, it's not a big deal. It's not a detriment. And why would he think about that? You know, he even said he's playing rugby and he said, oh, I haven't gotten injured yet. And I'm like, oh, that's good. I hope you don't get injured. He's like, oh mom, it doesn't, you know, he, he doesn't, he doesn't care. He just thought that was interesting. He could care less if he's hit. Yeah. Cause it's worth it for him for the enjoyment and the pleasure that he gets out of out of his sport isn't it it's like they told that will probably totally override <clears throat> and in a way you could use that almost like a metaphor for life in the same way is that if we really got present in our lives and enjoyed it and we wouldn't even entertain the idea of practicing what if something bad happened because we'd just be in it and that's so for him it's like why why am I going to consider getting injured when all I care about right now is the fun that I'm having between, and you know, and I'll deal with that if it happens. And again, it's like that with life. It's like we can, if we are in our lives present and enjoying the parts that show up and, you know, um, versus in our head and our intellect preparing and practicing for all worst case scenarios that, you know, that's what creates the suffering. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people ask me about, um, a metaphobia, you know, the fear of throwing up. Mm -hmm. And I know all of this already applies. Um, but you know how, when some people have stuff, they think, Oh, but this is different. Um, <laughs> yeah. Cause it's, you know, it's, uh, it's a funny, you know, it's, it's actually probably, mm, it's probably about 50% of young people that come to me at the moment have this fear. It's a large amount, a large amount. Recently, actually, I don't know why. Um, and it is the same. And, I, and I've worked with young people who have had, have gone from having such a fear of throwing up that they're refusing to go to school, they won't eat in restaurants, like lots of things where they're refusing to take part in their life, if you like, because of this fear, to actually within the space of four or five weeks, that's gone they're in restaurants, they're eating and they're back in school. Now that sounds like a phenomenal big milestone, but in actual fact, it's a simple understanding for them to take the fear and the unknown and the uncertainty out of it that just changes everything for them. And I think one of the reasons that fear and phobia of sickness can, can spiral, if you like, or stick, or certainly has in my experience with these young people recently, 
is because when we get anxious and worried about something and we go into fight or flight, one of the physical symptoms attached to fight or flight is our body making us go to the toilet more frequently, emptying our stomachs and adrenaline when we have too much of it can make us feel sick. So it's almost like the self-fulfilling, um, you know, cycle of I'm scared of being sick. I'm anxious. Oh, I do feel sick. It's coming true. See, I knew there was a risk of me being sick, but it's not that you're going to be sick. It's that your body feels uncomfortable and you've got that trip because of the adrenaline. And so it's actually the conversations I've had um, and what that they've transformed and turned around so quickly is because they've started to be able to get comfortable with that discomfort. So it's not that suddenly they don't feel sick anymore, but they're waking up in the morning and they feel that sickness and they're like, oh, I know what this is. I know it's safe. I know it's not, I've not got a sickness bug. I know this is because I've been worrying and you know, I've spoken to Sari about this and I know that it's only going to last this amount of time and da, da, da. And so they get comfortable with that discomfort to the point where actually very quickly it just goes. <laughs> Yeah. My daughter had a period of that and it was especially tied to, I mean, if anybody was sick, she'd be worried, but especially to travel. Mm -hmm. And uh, her and I did a lot of work and I was very into gestalt therapy at this time. So we did a lot of like drawing and talking about it and it, um, and all of us is just a deeper understanding. And it kind of, I, I also love art and, you know, but she, she's 15 now and she recognizes just what you were saying, just kind of intuitively. And from the conversations that we had a lot when she was younger, um, where sometimes she's rationally not afraid of flying, but there's a, or throwing up on the plane or the travel day, there's just a little bit more, you know, she doesn't, I'm not sure if she's like, Oh, it's adrenaline. She can feel a little bit nauseous in the morning. So, but she knows exactly what it is. And so she she takes care of herself in this beautiful, creative way where the morning before we travel, she started like, she set out like some little crackers and stuff. So she gets up a little bit earlier and eats in bed and kind of has a slow morning. And she realized that she likes to bring um, snacks, like certain snacks, like pop cereal. And so she just kind of eats throughout the day because there might be a little of adrenaline, but she doesn't add on to it with her thinking. And she can recognize when her stomach can kind of feel more settled. She can. Right. Um, and I thought, oh, that was, um, I didn't ever tell her, oh, but she knows I don't like to do a rush if I realize that. And she, um, yeah, she's really recognized that hasn't she? And that's what wisdom does. So she's, she's, she's heard her wisdom, which has, has encouraged her to eat because the tummy's empty and slow. And I can remember doing that, getting on flights with that horrible feet, like taking tiny little bites. It's like, I feel sick. I don't want to eat this. But actually, you, once you start telling your stomach, you do want food, you do need, then it, it, that helps settle and and that she's not rushing. And again, one of the things I used to do with flying is I'd leave my pack until the last minute because I was so anxious about it. And then packing would be horrendous because I'd be packing whilst really anxious. So then at one point when I realised I would pack well in advance so I could forget about it and leave it and just like you know like you've saying with your daughter and take it slow and it's great that she's intuitively from her wisdom picked that up and that is accessible to us and actually in a way that's what mine and your job is isn't it Lily when we work with people really is it's not for us to give them the solution it's for us to point them gently in that direction for those answers which they've got within them but might not always um that can we can lose sight of it when we're too caught up in our anxious thinking but you know i love that she's noticed that for herself it's it's very empowering i think when we realize oh i feel terrible but i'm okay and i'm going to take care of myself and i'm going to be gentle and patient with myself rather than get all frustrated and worked up with something that i just simply cannot control <laughs> yeah 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 and I think it's wonderful that you've seen such, I don't know, I don't want to even place a judgment say progress, but like how fast it can turn around. Oh, you know, so um, so young people pick it up so quickly. And I, I, I mean, I'm just making this up, but I believe it's because they don't have as many conditioned beliefs by that age. And it's like, I feel like they're often so much more open-minded. It's like, they just listen. And I know they've listened, because then they're not sick, feeling sick anymore. So they must have heard something, you know, and yeah. it's just, yeah, it's so nice to, it, you know, it feels like such a gift to point them in that direction. And, you know, to imagine going from every morning before school, 
hanging over a toilet, retching, feeling so awful to in a space of weeks, being able to get up and just go to school is just like, oh, and that is what we all have access to. And so if anybody listens to this who feels overwhelmed or physical symptoms that just feel debilitating and don't just to know that this is never permanent and actually it's only for you to see things slightly different from another perspective and everything will completely change. Yeah. And we said for kids, but you are no exception. Whoever is listening, even if you're 65, I have a woman who's 65 in my group. She's just, she's, she was feeling good. She said she had insight. She doesn't have any more. This isn't about a phobia, derealization or depersonalization after like 40 something years. And she's just like, you know, she just heard something. And I actually feel like I talk to a lot of young adults, like early twenties and some of them, like they just get it so fast. Like it's crazy. And even though I had a lot of conditions, beliefs, you know, especially as a school psychologist and being more in a traditional mental health field. And when I found you and I took your, it was a five or seven day anxiety course, my, my life started to turn around in a matter of weeks. You know, I, it was almost five years ago, but I think I heard something in the way that you shared it and what you were sharing and my relationship to like panic and driving anxiety just started to turn around. And so for anybody listening, yeah, I love that message that you're never stuck. You know, we can have insights that can change us from the inside out and it can be so effortless where your phobia can fall away without you having to expose yourself to it or work hard at it. And I, I'll say one thing and then I'll be done with my talk. Like I used to have a a fear of snakes, a huge fear for years and years and years. I would have nightmares about snakes. Like it was hard for me to even look at books. Like I hated snakes for all the reasons that your friend was with the mice. It was like (laughs) unpredictability. (laughs) Like I, I, I had so much thinking about snakes really. And also like, I didn't ever encounter snakes, but they, like, I, I didn't, probably nothing of it was intentional, but I thought about snakes. I was like, really gave it a lot of energy. I had a lot of fear of snakes for, and then I was a nanny and, um, and I was 20 and I had, um, these two kids who were so sweet. They were actually in my wedding. I was very close. And the younger one, he didn't, wasn't in school. He was like in preschool. And so we would go to the zoo a lot. And there was like a reptile thing, but he knew I was afraid of snakes. But so Mm -hmm. he wanted to go into the reptile thing. And I thought, I can't avoid it because I don't want him to think that the, I, so I was going to go in there for him because I didn't want to, to limit him or, or let him see my fear holding me back. So we go into this and I would have never done that when actually, when I would take my brother and stuff, sometimes we'd go to parties. I, would, I couldn't be anywhere near snakes, but I took it more seriously as, you know, being a nanny and I'm pushing him in his stroller and he's like two or three. And he's like looking back at me to check and see how I was doing and like oh. patting my hand. And I don't, and then, and I know in a way that's some sort of exposure, but like, I just fell away. Like I didn't work hard at it, but when I saw his reaction and I've never, ever been afraid of snakes since then, you know, and that was over 20 years ago. And I probably had that insight that like, he wasn't afraid. It was like the snakes, they were so big. And then in that moment, it just, it just fell away. And I never dream about them again. I never, I didn't have any more thinking on them. And I think sometimes, and another point that you've made there is sometimes an insight just comes in the way of a feeling rather than a thought. So we don't always fully understand how and why, but we just sense that something has shifted. And that's again, what I love about this conversation is that it's not we don't have to know, we don't have to do it in a certain way, we don't have to, in fact, somebody messaged me today after listening to um, one of the challenge videos that I did and and her exact words were, I can't explain it, something shifted or something changed and I can't put it into words, I just know it was a feeling. And that is, for me, how a lot of insights can work. And so people might say, well, how, so how do I get that then if it's not, if it's just, well, it's just by being open-minded, in, you know, increasing your awareness, exploring like you are doing, listen to this podcast now. And you just hear things that are different. And then they just, that's how change occurs when we see a, a shift in our perspective. But we don't have to fully know exactly what that looks like in order for that to happen. 
Yeah. Because people have been having insights all the time. You know, when you started talking and walking, you didn't think, well, now I'm going to walk. You just saw people walking and thought, you know, you, you didn't have to plan it. You just did it, you know, and we have insights all the time about driving and our jobs and, um, and our hobbies, you know, where stuff just kind of clicks into place, whether it's about dancing or singing or crocheting or like cooking, you know, we, we are having insights all the time that like, just, it's just this feeling. It's just this knowing, oh, suddenly yeah, like, I but try we, this or I could try. do you know? It's funny. I was going to do um a reel earlier, and I didn't quite catch Aria in time, but I'm going to catch on it. I was going to do a reel of saying, don't always. Everything doesn't always turn out how you think it has to, or you know, it's not doesn't have to be in a set way or anything. Because what she it was so funny watching her start to move like she's getting frustrated now. She wants to grab everything. She wants to be on the move, and she's seven months, and she's like, I don't want to sit here. This is boring. I you know I want to be. I want to touch that I want to touch this and she can't crawl on her front at the moment she can turn onto her front but she's very quickly realized by just accidentally falling on her back and then realizing something different oh I can push myself back on my back so now she literally flies across the room just on her back pushing herself back and it's so funny to watch because and she and she she learned that accidentally. And I think, again, a lot of our insights are almost, for want of a better term, accidental. It's like, we just so, ah, oh, okay, I can do that. And then one day she's going to realise on a front, if she moves slightly like this, then that's going to propel her forward. And the temptation actually is to hold her feet and push her and let her know that's how you do it. And I have to stop myself because I'm like, actually, this is going to come from her and she's going to find out the best way for her. Um, in her own time and it's very tempted as a parent to go look this is what you do and move them but she'll find her way and it's so fascinating to watch and then and again you know she has no judgment about the fact that she's flying across the room on her back like she looks hilarious and it's funny to us because we would never crawl across the room on our backs but to her it's like I'm moving I don't care this is great and and I love again that the babies are such an example of the non-judgment like she's like I don't care how I'm getting there I'm getting there and I'm happy with it. <laughs> I love it. And that's that greater intelligence. She didn't have to like think about it. She's not going to have, she's not thinking. I'm on my back now. How am I going to get in my front? And I got to crawl. But you know what? I want to make sure I crawl because if I don't crawl, it's actually not good for me to go straight to walking. You know, so I, I think I'm going to, the research tells me I should crawl for three months and then go to walking. So yes. uh, should I walk? Like we just overcomplicate it, which is it's, we're beautiful humans, but Aria and, and every baby and every teen and every adult, we all have this greater intelligence and anxiety, panic, phobias. It's no different. We just can innocently overcomplicate it when we put our brain on the job when, and I think that's what I love about this conversation is like when I kind of sent my brain on holiday, it was like, it's, it's enough. Like yeah. we can go back to, uh, intuitively moving through life more of the time with just our common sense and our wisdom, you know, and, and crawling on your back, flying, it, that's wisdom. That's, that's creativity. You mm-hmm. know, we're actually, if we try to use our brain, we're not going to be as creative. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I started to see that um, just, I would get excited to just give my brain a break and see what creative ideas come because when we're not taking it so personally, wisdom to just jump in and, and um, sometimes we just have a feeling and yeah. sometimes we sometimes we have a creative idea that might be a workaround or that might just poof the phobia the, the the energy all the thinking might just poof or we just have an acceptance and we think who cares I I'm afraid of frogs and I'm living my best life it doesn't matter you know and then you just don't have any thinking on it yeah exactly exactly yeah, yeah. I'll have to try and capture that and uh, share yeah. it you can all laugh yeah. at her. <laughs> oh dear so I think that's a nice place to end it um and as ever if anyone's got any questions for Lily or I do get in touch and please keep sharing your ideas on what you would like us to talk about we'll share some more information I think we're going to do our next podcast live so people can join us and actually join us and listen live so look out for information on that and we'll share that soon we don't know what the topic will be we'll leave it open to you um but yeah thank you so much and thanks Lily as ever. Thank you. Thank you. I know. I'm so excited that you mentioned the live and that you had that idea because I think it will be really, really great. And then maybe this is our live 
virtual, but then one day maybe we'll do a live like in person. Yes, we really will. Fun. And I am that coming to the really US. Fun. I've said this, I am. And I'm going to get you to the UK as well. Yes. <laughs> I, yes, I would love that. We meet people. We have a big fun event. Yes, that would be amazing. Okay, thanks everyone. Bye. Bye.